you know, I've been giving a lot of talks about specific things like education or politics and so on in the Czech and the Slovak republics and so on, but uh, the, to take the swings through my entire life uh, is really kind of unique and part of that reason was that I didn't want to talk about it very much and many people didn't ask me, you know, because uh, sometimes when we welcome foreigners here, <coughs> like the <coughs> international students, uh, we assume they are like a tabula rasa and their life doesn't start until they came uh, here and, and so <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, it, it's it's al always focused on what I did uh, in this country, and that was, of course, a very rich uh, career. This is my topic here: shifting landscapes, and there is indeed a lot of shifting, and it's much more than landscapes too. I was looking for uh, some uh, picture that would give me a theme, and I found this one. <clears throat> It was uh, taken by a famous photographer, my 11-year-old granddaughter, who was taken very much by these puppets. And um, so t to her, you know, it certainly uh, looked like something very interesting. And even more so when I told her that in my days, when I was growing up, virtually a very child had his, his or her own puppet theater. You know, I had my own and it was a fantastic learning experience, you know. We actually learned to write plays and we acted out through puppets, things, you know, that you could not act uh, otherwise to. I even had my own uh, kind of like a painting a place where we produced our own uh, back, uh, the, 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 the scenery and so on, and even made a few puppets of, of our own. They were the small ones, not uh, these larger ones, and so on. But I think there are several other reasons other than the fact that my granddaughter liked this idea. Uh, puppets uh, have, in fact, saved the Czech language. And I, even as a small child, I remember these traveling groups uh, coming with a horse and buggy from village to village and offering a a series of plays, always uh, different. And they not only reflected uh, the, the life of common people, uh, but they were in a literal check, perfect literal check. And they started at the time when the Habsburgs, in fact, oppressed the Czech language. You know, they, in fact, wanted to eliminate any reference to the Czech language. So these uh, theaters traveling through villages and so on kept the culture going. And they often focused on the Czech mythology. So they uh, informed people about the history of uh, the Czech and the Slovak people uh, uh, because uh, no, no, nobody assumed there was a history prior to the Habsburgs. So, you know, the history goes back to, of course, about 900 uh, years after Christ, and so this was a, a very helpful kind of thing. But there was one other reason why the puppets uh, appealed to me as the kind of a theme for my presentation, and that is the uh, the fact that people learned the Shvekovina even before Shvek was written. Everybody in the audience knew who the bad guys were, and they were puppets, but at the same time they always presumed to be the Austrian inspectors, uh, uh, oppressors of, of something like that. So the bad guys were always associated with the regime, but the regime inspectors and the censors didn't know the culture, and so this this passed, uh, of course, all the kind of censorship. So I, I'm very pleased with that, uh, with that kind of a picture. This is a, a very uh, typical part of the history of the Czech and the Slovak uh, people out here. I am very much uh, pleased that you uh, came to hear me. Uh, because, as I said, this is the first time that I reflect and I bring some of my own experiences and I want you to know that it's not just depending on what I have lived through, uh, but in fact I have augmented much uh, of my 
uh, points, my learning and so on, through subsequent literature, and there is a tremendous amount of it too. Now, I don't know the figures for Slovakia, maybe Dan, you would know too, but in the Czech Republic there is something like 35,000 new books being published every year. That's a small country, and so this number is, you know, very impressive. The problem is that much of that deals with the past, and I will refer back uh, to this kind of a point out here. Um, the, uh, the idea of the retrospect is uh, legitimate, I, I guess, even in the social sciences today too, particularly if it is based on, uh, uh, on some knowledge, some facts, and so on. And I do hope that my presentation will be sufficiently uh, uh, factual. Uh, let me tell you a little more about my own uh, orientation. My field, as you probably know, is uh, international education, which is a, a very wide field. It's multi-dimensional, multi-disciplinary. It takes about 15 academic disciplines to understand a culture. So if you hear a historian, you only get a partial story about what is happening, and the historians have their own biases. I'm always puzzled when I hear historians, like the last time at the uh, the, the National Czech and Slovak Museum in Cedar Rapids. They, they only had historians come. And they, they give you precise knowledge, tremendous details and so on. But the details are sort of sequential, like if uh, uh, things happen sequentially from one day to the next day to the next week to the next year. Well, the history of uh, the Czech and Slovak republics is not that sequential and not uh, not that uh, uh, routine, not that progressive out here. So um, I bring then my own comments and I will conclude my uh, presentation with some common themes that I uh, see in this too. Uh, when I first came here, I always hated, I travel a great deal, but I used to pretend to sleep to avoid any possible conversations with my uh, my, my traveling uh, partners there because they always wanted to, they recognize my accent and so where are you from? And the next question was, how do you like it here? And then the next question was, well, how come that the Czech people are the communists, that they support the regime so much? And I didn't have any answers for that because that was, of course, one of the most depressing things for us. We didn't have exact uh, information about what is going on. Now we know uh, otherwise, but you know, at that time it really did appear that most of the people, particularly in the Czech part of the Republic, that was not true in Slovakia, did support the communist regime. There was, of course, a, a change, substantial change that came particularly <coughs> the 60s. Now here are the eight countries that I came from and the, the thing that I want to stress again is that the sequence was not really normal and natural and so on. Uh, the history was not continuous from one stage to the other but in fact highly discontinuous. You know, I uh, of course was born uh, in this year so that was a significant year for me not only because I was born, uh, but also because of the fact that uh, this was the year when the country was finally beginning to recover from the uh, tremendous uh, damage that has been done through World War I. Uh, you know, the whole thing was disruptive, disrupted. The transportation, uh, finances, uh, production, agriculture, and so on. There was hardly any livestock, you know, it was all killed for the uh, Austrian military and so on. So it took seven years for the uh, country, in fact, uh, to recover. And yet the other complication was that it was surrounded all by dictatorship. There was uh, a dictatorship in Poland, uh, in Austria, uh, Susnik, uh, certainly in Hungary. And Germany was in total disarray at the time, uh, with Hitler already beginning to emerge in the early 20s already out here. So here is 
uh, how the first seven years before I was born uh, were characterized and what uh, in fact changes, what the shifting landscape and so on meant for the, for the people out here. You know, first of all there was a widespread famine and in fact it was the United States that produced a fantastic amount of aid. There was 500,000 people daily uh, in the soup kitchens. And I had a, a personal connection with that because the dean of the college of McAllister by the name of Huntley Dupre, I don't know some of you older people may know him, one of the buildings is named by him, was the one who was the head of that particular program in the Czech Republic. And when he learned about me, we had met at some point, uh, he always asked me to be a speaker at uh, the college about uh, Tomáš Masaryk, the first president of Czechoslovakia then, uh, on March 7th. So I was a, 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 a kind of a steady feature. The problem was that uh, there was hardly any resources about Masaryk. So after the first three years, I was running about ideas what to say about Masaryk. He was a very complex <coughs> uh, individual, in fact. And even though we grew up on him, uh, that didn't mean that we understood what he was saying. It was a very complex uh, set of uh, ideas that he was presenting, and he himself was a very complex uh, individual out here. Now, the things that were so unstable at the time uh, was, of course, the currency. So the government had to uh, initiate some very drastic currency reform that of course affected a lot of people, especially in Slovakia out here. Now there was a number of insurrections. There was a threat of the Hungarians to occupy part of Slovakia again. <clears throat> and that in fact had to be handled through military intervention. The Poles, in fact, we had a, about a seven day war with the Poles. My father, in fact, was a member of the Armistice Commission that was negotiating the peace. There was again the effort of Poland to recapture some of the places in Silesia. And the Germans, of course, were the primary uh, difficulty because most of them uh, decided to secede from the Republic and, in fact, to join Austria uh, as, uh, as part of the, the previous Austrian monarchy. That one had to be also handled through the military. So you see there was you know, uh, continual uh, problems out here. We assume somehow that the transition was routine and uh, peaceful and normal, and in many ways it was. But I think that there were incidents of difficulties, including the fact that there was some anti-clerical uh, uh, problems. You know, people were in fact destroying some statues of the saints and so forth and that this certainly had to be stopped by the government that was committed to uh, a freedom of expression of both religious and political out here. The uh, other uh, issue of course that uh, came into being was the what to do with the Austrian monopolies. And they had to be nationalized and so could this of course created the picture somehow that the country was going socialist when in fact that was not the case. There simply was no other solution except to nationalize these industries and that became a pattern for most of the rest of the time. Now some people in Slovakia in fact declared Slovakia as a <coughs> Soviet Republic and wanted to join the Soviet Union. So there was some impact of the Bolshevik Revolution in the Soviet Union at the time, and particularly uh, after the legionnaires started coming back. You are undoubtedly familiar with the story of the Czechoslovak Legion. Uh, in Russia, there was as many as 70,000 strong at one point. There had to be, there was the first country, in fact, at war with Stalin, with the Bolsheviks, and Stalin had never forgotten or forgiven that. And that was his mindset against the people from the Czech and Slovak republics whom he seriously never trusted. Now, 
I then lived after the year of 25 in a sort of idyllic setting. The country was prosperous. In fact, it was one of the top 10 but most industrialized and most prosperous countries in the world at the time. A tremendous export industry, because which it inherited, of course, from the Austrians. Uh, and the industry was wide, you know, uh, machines, uh, locomotives, uh, heavy industry, automobiles, uh, motorcycles, uh, but also agricultural production and uh, textile. Textile was a strong uh, industry that used to export and so forth. So um, <clears throat> we had um, uh, some finally uh, came to the kind of the key year of 1935. I was only 10 years old, and at that time I was taking my exams to enter the gymnasium. These were highly selected. Only one out of 10 uh, applicants was actually admitted. So my entering class was about 120, divided into four sections, A, B, C, D, and uh, eventually, uh, the gymnasium was closed by the Nazis because they, uh, well, uh, we, we were sort of smart kids and we <coughs> conducted a little skit against uh, Hitler. And I played Hitler myself in that <coughs> skit. And somebody leaked on us and uh, reported all of a sudden tanks came with the Gestapo to the building. They closed the entire gymnasium kicked out everybody, of course, and seven of us responsible for that had faced the wall with machine guns behind us uh, for a full day of questioning. At the age of 14, you can imagine, I still feel that, you know, because we had to face the wall and the, uh, the Gestapo and the, uh, the police uh, were always pushing us uh, head into the wall and so on. This was a very traumatic experience. Uh, fortunately, and I think this tells you a little bit of the story of the satellite government, the, uh, they actually did help a lot. And one of the uh, directors of another gymnasium went to Prague to the Ministry of Education, at least they had some jurisdiction, and he said he would not return until all of the students from the gymnasium in Jelemnica would be accepted to uh, the gymnasium in Novapaka, which was another city nearby. So uh, they eventually consented, but we had to report to the police every week that we were still there and of course under tremendous uh, pressure to behave our, ourselves and, and we certainly got the message. This was very difficult uh, because the, and I, I have a picture that somebody saved, I guess, from our final exam from the 120 who started out in that group, uh, there was eight of us who graduated. They actually uh, allowed uh, about eight more, but they were already in the what they call total Einsatz. Uh, that that was they were drafted to work for the Nazis to essentially dispose of uh, dead bodies after bombardments in Germany too. So there was about 16 people who finally graduated from that group. The, the Nazis just plain didn't want educated uh, Czechs and the, uh, Aust uh, the Hungarians didn't want educated uh, Slovaks uh, either out here. This was a, a crucial year for us because Hitler already was in power and generated a tremendous amount of, uh, uh, of hostility among the Germans toward the Czechs. There had been quite a bit of hostility before, and I will return to that a little later out here. Masaryk's health deteriorated so much that he actually resigned from the presidency, and Banish became the president. Masaryk eventually died two years later, 1937. There was a great shock for the nation, of course, and so on. We were busily, uh, developing and building the Czech Maginot Line uh, defensive uh, positions. They still exist today and they could not destroy them. That's how 
solid they have been, incidentally. The difficulty was that they were facing Germany to the east, and of course Germany by this time had already occupied Austria, so the entire southern flank was uh, was not uh, uh, covered out here. That was one of the reasons, I guess, uh, for Benesch to have accepted the dictates of Munich out here. The uh, Czechoslovak Republic at the time had to depend on treaties. And we had a treaty with uh, the French of mutual assistance, and the French had a similar treaty with the British. So the, the British have, you know, we had always blamed the British for the tragedy of Munich, but as a matter of fact, the British had no legal responsibility or treaty obligation to Czechoslovakia, simply because of the fact that their participation would have depended on the French, who obviously refused uh, to provide the kind of assistance. We also had a mutual assistance treaty with the Soviets. Uh, that was uh, signed in 1935, the same year. But that treaty also stipulated that uh, uh, the, the Soviets would come to, uh, to aid only if the French did or if the League of Nations at the time, which was uh, something that uh, Benesch as the foreign minister had placed a great deal of emphasis on. As we know now from retrospect, the League of Nations uh, was a total failure and of course of no assistance to produce or provide collective security uh, in Europe out here. So we also depended on the little entente that was Romania, Yugoslavia and, and Czechoslovakia. But the problem was that that treaty was directed against the Hungarians in case of their hostility towards Slovakia. So that did not provide, for example, for any assistance in case the Germans would, would attack out here. And Henlein's party was already uh, in full strength. There were two Nazi-related parties. Incidentally, the uh, German Nazis have been in touch with Hitler long before Hitler was even in power, beginning about 1924 or something like that, before I was born. So they already had, and, and Hitler had clearly in mind that uh, the present, the, the Czechoslovakia of that time, was in fact part of the Greater Reich, that there was the heart of Europe that they wanted to command, and that he would eventually uh, gain that, uh, if uh, necessary, by force. Now, I was only 14 then when this uh, hostility began, be uh, started developing out here. And I was very active in both the Sokol and the Scout uh, movement. Uh, we were, in fact, nationalized into the paramilitary force because the Republic had declared mobilization, total mobilization, twice. It was a tremendous uh, atmosphere to oppose the Nazis. And when the pressure started coming for the uh, secession or for the ceding of the Sudetenland, which would have been almost one-third of the entire country, in fact, uh, then uh, the, uh, the, the country was determined to, to fight. To this date, people are debating whether we should have fought uh, or not. This is uh, called uh, uh, sort of like the uh, historical uh, uh, po point, you know, that never happened. So th that kind of an argument really makes no no sense to to anybody. But people are still depending, uh, uh, debating that. And part of the problem, of course, is that. Uh, uh, nobody has the, the, the true facts because we cannot determine what would have happened. The damage of the occupation was far greater probably than would have been uh, had we fought at that time. And of course there is now uh, information available that uh, the, uh, the, there were people in the German uh, military uh, from originally from the Prussian, sort of the typical professional soldiers who would have opposed uh, Hitler and in fact might have even assassinated him had he uh, proceeded. But of course that didn't happen and I think we all know 
Uh, can you imagine at the age of 14 we were mobilized, uh, trained to shoot, to kill, uh, with guns that were heavier than we were? And, and when we finally did get the, the guns uh, pointed at somebody, the uh, reaction the, 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 uh, yeah, from, from the, the pressure of the gun was, was such that they probably threw us on the floor again someplace, but we took it very seriously. And it's the, the, the kind of thing that uh, I have never forgotten out here. A Munich tragedy, of course, was uh, uh, probably even less of a tragedy if you think of that because there were no heroes in that tragedy that you normally associate with uh, the tragic uh, literature out here. There's no question that the Allies, particularly the French, have betrayed their word. And, and there were, of course, uh, good reasons for the French. They were not prepared, even though they were the ones who financed that uh, system of fortifications throughout the country out here. Uh, the the uh, Czechoslovak military was about one million strong. But the problem was that the Germans were also part of the military. And Henlein and his party started gaining a tremendous amount of support. You know, at the time, at the last elections, his party obtained 78% of the vote. And, and this created the impression, you know, that all Germans, they were not good Germans, you know, except very few. They were mostly the Social Democrats who opposed the Nazis, but they also failed in their opposition uh, towards them. The, uh, I still uh, recall, because we lived in the uh, areas uh, adjacent to the Sudetenland, how the armed uh, German military uh, came with their tanks and so on right by our house. And the border which they occupied was maybe 200 meters away from our house. And then I have seen, of course, uh, little uh, horse and buggy carts uh, from the Czechs who were being expelled from the Sudetenland with just uh, practically what they had on, on their backs out here. This was a very sad story uh, that uh, I also remember very, very vividly. And it had something uh, to do then with the subsequent attitudes toward the Germans uh, in 1945. And I will come back to it too. Now, living under the Nazi regime was a, a struggle. It was constant fear. Every time you saw a green Tatra car, you knew that was a police car. You knew that was the Gestapo and that they were on the way to uh, get somebody arrested. And uh, when that happened, uh, you had no idea what would happen to that uh, individual. Most of them would not return. The total number of people killed during the Nazi time was about 400,000 people. So that's like the entire population of Minneapolis, practically. And it wasn't just the tragedy of the numbers of people killed, to about 250 of the thousand would have been the Jewish uh, people. The figures vary, and I think you would find various uh, figures documenting the, the damage on lives. But for, for, for the Czechs and the, for, for the, uh, the Slovaks are somewhat uh, uh, left uh, without this, this type of uh, the totalitarianism. But the, the biggest damage was the fact that they focused on the intelligentsia, which is then essentially what wiped out the leadership structure. And when the crucial year of 1945 came and 1948 eventually, uh, we had no leadership. The Communist Party was the only group that in fact did have leadership that cultivated it, uh, its plans during the entire time. I was a member of a, a student legion at the time that we created as, a, as an underground organization. One of my professors of physics, for example, was a kind of an expert on the 
uh, the, the V2 uh, weapons, you know, the rackets, you know, that the Germans started uh, producing and that would have been, so I think we had some of these uh, uh, plans out here. What was amazing is that the, uh, the Czech and the Slovak people had fantastic intelligence operating. They had in fact somebody right in the heart of the German uh, general staff of the military who provided very adequate and accurate information. In fact, a month before the Germans invaded uh, Poland, for example, this was already known that they were going to do that. And one week before it happened, they even specified the date when that would happen. And people did not pay much attention to that kind of information. And that same type of uh, intelligence operation existed uh, during the Czechoslovak Legion in Russia. You know, at that time it was the Tsarist Russia. They provided uh, uh, and managed to accumulate some of the best information about the uh, movement of the Austrian and particularly the German military, which has led to some spectacular victories for which the Czechoslovak uh, Legion in Russia was in fact responsible. There was a tremendous amount of uh, heroic uh, effort that was affected uh, to it. The Germans of course had a plan green as they call it and that was something that Hitler had formulated before as I mentioned that he was determined uh, to seize the entire country as part of the, of the, the, the Third Reich uh, the plant green would have called for, you know, initially for elimination of all the people in the Czechs and the Slovaks. That was eventually then changed and the document became available uh, during the International uh, Tribunal in Munich, in uh, Nuremberg, after World War II, uh, that finally called for elimination of one third of the Czechs particularly Czechs, because he really disliked the Czechs more than the Slovaks. Uh, one third would have been evacuated uh, someplace to the Ukraine to presumably grow wheat for the, and food for the uh, German uh, people. And one third would remain to provide uh, needed services, provided that they could be uh, integrated into the, the German Reich. So that, that plan uh, existed indeed. And I am reminded of that too, that uh, somehow, uh, you know, my father was a, 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 a superintendent of what they call minority schools. There was the Czech schools in a predominantly German areas. I was born in a city called Vrchlabí, was just underneath the mountains and um, the 70 percent of the population were Germans. And so we had faced as a family the hostility of the Germans toward the Czechs a very single day. In fact, eventually the office of my father had to be moved because they could not find housing. Because the Germans simply would not want anybody who was Czech you know, to, to, to live with them. Uh, restaurants, for example, would have signs which said, no Czech, Czechs, Jews, and dogs allowed. So you see, the, 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 this, this kind of hostility was generated precisely during the time that I was growing up, that I was beginning to understand something, something was, was happening out here. That was the plant green and that was the Nazi occupation. But my father still believed in the ability somehow of the rational beings to uh, be able to overcome some of this kind of ideological uh, divide and uh, uh, created in fact a kind of a primitive exchange of people, they call it Austausch. And I myself was in fact uh, sent to a family of a German uh, superintendent he knew from German schools. You obviously understand that the Germans had their own schools and the university, for example, and so on. And that they, in fact, had German political parties that spoke in the parliament in German. And so there was a real effort on part of the 
the Czechoslovak Republic, in fact, to, to allow the independence of the Germans and to, uh, to uh, sort of uh, give them the uh, acknowledgement, the recognition, and the respect uh, which they were seeking. When, while I was there, uh, my counterpart was a fellow by the name of Helmut. He was a little bit older than I was. And uh, one time I was not home, my mother was home alone. Helmut showed up in the Hitler Jugend uniform with all kinds of medals hanging on his uh, breast. And uh, he came to thank us for uh, the nice time that he had with my family. And uh, he said that because of that, you know, he thinks that my family are the nice Czechs and therefore when the Nazis will win the war, that he will, uh, in fact, intervene on our behalf so my family would be saved from evacuation. Even a 16 or 17 year old fellow already knew that there were some plans like that to eliminate the whole nation out here. And I'm not exaggerating because after I escaped, you know, we lived in Nuremberg for a while and I knew the French, one of the uh, the French uh, prosecutors of the uh, team, you know, through a, a program that I originated when I was in the law school. And uh, he, uh, he, he in fact made that uh, plan green uh, available to me. Uh, well, then came the year of 1945, another uh, key uh, year out uh, of there. The question was, you know, for most of us, we assumed that life would return to normal the way it was before, but that was not to be. The Czech uh, government, uh, partially because of the decision of President Benes and partially because of uh, pressure from the communists who, in fact, organized a separate exile government in Moscow. You know, Benes decided to uh, traveled to Moscow twice, once to sign a, uh, another treaty of mutual assistance, and, and another one, in fact, uh, uh, before he returned to Czechoslovakia, so that there would be one unified government, and he made so many concessions to the communists that, in fact, uh, came to roost. Uh, one of the concessions was that the communists would dominate the Ministry of Interior and the Ministry of Agriculture. Another decision was that all Germans were going to be expelled from the country, and the Soviets certainly supported that, and you know, to some extent the Western powers reluctantly also, but only cautioned that it be done uh, humanely, which it was not. And that was one of the darkest uh, part of uh, the history of the, particularly the Czech people, who have really treated the Germans very brutally. And, and that was unfortunate. And that story is still playing itself out. There still is a strong organization of the Sudeten Germans in Germany uh, who co continually uh, push to return and to have their own property restored uh, to them. So that, that part, you know, people still living uh, in the past out here. So Munich uh, became very much a part of that. And I think that from the point of view of both Benesch and Jan Masaryk, who became the foreign minister, uh, the key uh, turning point was uh, Lidice. When the assassination against Heydrich uh, came up, the Germans overreacted. 23,000 individual people have been shot to death and some of them summarily as a result of the Heydrichiade. And, and this, this was an you know, extremely sad part of our, of our history out here. But uh, when the news about Lidice came up, you know, I think that this was a turning point in creating kind of a mindset. And I will return to that point when I give my conclusions uh, out here. The mindset was that before that, people did distinguish between good Germans and bad Germans. And after Lidice, this transformation uh, developed here that all Germans were in fact bad 
and, and this became a generalized hostility toward everything German, and, and that led, of course, to the expulsion of the of the Germans. So it simply led to a conclusion that we could no longer live peacefully with uh, any Germans except those who were communists, and that, in fact, uh, uh, de developed that there was a number of German population. I can testify to that personally because my family was half Czech and half German. Uh, my uh, two aunts married Sudeten Germans. One was a very strong social democrat who refused to join the Nazi party and was demoted correspondingly and he got kicked out as part of the Germans. The other one was very much a a uh, Nazi uh, promoter, including my cousin, who reported my father for listening to the BBC, for example. And he became a communist and stayed. So this kind of thing, you see, was happening uh, to it too. When my grandmother died, and this was uh, just a few weeks before the Nazis occupied Poland, I think. The whole family was the last time that the family got all together. There was a huge fight that developed. I was too young to understand and they sent us kids away from that, but it really almost came to blows and, and the family never recovered to so from that. So this was a uh, an affair that happened to us personally and happened to many uh, people who had either mixed marriages or <coughs> something like that, one of the most prominent uh, musicians by the name of Hushler. His wife was German, and it was the opposite of what was happening. She, in fact, refused to be a German, even though uh, she was under great pressure to divorce him, and so on. Uh, eventually, he was arrested and died in a concentration camp, and his wife continued uh, to support strongly the, the Czechoslovak Republic that emerged from the, the, after the World War II. The Košice program that was developed by, by the people, there was a pretty long story out here, uh, you know, that is very difficult to repeat in great detail. But there was no question that the communists had planned already the takeover. This little underground organization that I told you about, uh, we had been aware of the fact that the Soviets have dropped a substantial number of paratroopers. They never made any contact with us, and as we found later, they simply dispersed to organize communist cells. 1943, for example, already. We were still fighting the Nazis, and they were already organizing to, to take over. So. Uh, the reality, I think, as I mentioned, was really the so-called National Front, which, uh, which essentially made it impossible to have any opposition to anybody. And if you opposed the National Front, which was dominated by the Social Democrats and the Communists, you were an enemy of the people. The major political parties from before the war have not been allowed to reconstitute, so we had only four uh, political parties, and I joined one of them myself, was very active in it. Our student uh, organizations were dominated by political parties, and that was one of the reasons why I was arrested, uh, actually even before the, uh, the, the, uh, the um, resignation of the cabinet ministers had been announced. The, the communists eventually took over, forced Benesch to accept the, uh, the resignations of the ministers, and uh, that was the end of that. Uh, most of the people blamed Benesch for this, but Benesch was very strictly a formalistic uh, uh, organizer. He assumed that the, the Constitution would have allowed him to dismiss the cabinet, appoint a new cabinet, and declare new elections. And that's what was the reason why the ministers resigned. The problem was that there wasn't enough of them. And the biggest disappointment to most of us was that Jan Masaryk, 
who was uh, the son of the builder of the country, had in fact neglected to resign himself. And so that gave Benesh essentially, because he was such a strict constructionist, a, uh, forced him in fact to accept the resignations and of course to nominate Gottwald as the framer of the new cabinet, and that's already what happened. Now, to uh, uh, Jan Masaryk apparently never even understood what he did or what he should have done. Uh, he was uh, apparently a very undecisive kind of an individual and lacked the kind of personal courage, you know, that for example his father would have had out here. There was uh, a tremendous interference from the Soviet embassy. In fact, Gottwald had a meeting with Zorin, who was the ambassador of the Soviet Union, every day at 9 o'clock in the morning from 1945 on. And then, of course, Zorin was called back, and a new ambassador came, and the same pattern uh, prevailed again out here. So when the February 48 came out here, there was a complete kind of failure of leadership on part of the democratic parties out here. They didn't communicate very well. In fact, a couple of the social democrats, for example, who uh, really would have been key to the number of the ministers who resigned, uh, have not been informed about what was going on. So Václav Meyer, for example, one of the most respected social democrats from the pre-war time, finally submitted his resignation, but it was already too late and Benesh had already accepted uh, the, uh, the, the resignations out here. Students were the only ones in the opposition. I was often uh, accused that I didn't participate in the student demonstrations, but I had a good reason. I was already sitting in jail at that time in one of the worst uh, uh, prisons in the so-called Bartolomeyska ulica, just south of the Wenceslau Square which was in fact in a special uh, division called uh, Department F, which was for anti-state activities. And that was managed almost entirely by KGB. Uh, what a surprise for me, for example, when I found out that they had about a three-inch file uh, on me, and that much of the file had to do something with anything that I have said, because I was also uh, campaigning throughout the country for the elections that never came and that should have taken place in May of 1948. Uh, the, uh, the information was being submitted by uh, my fellow student leaders who were communists. And then one day they actually came to interrogate me and I realized that they had been on the payroll of the secret police all along. And uh, so. So the subsequent uh, years, of course, were you know, extremely uh, turbulent. The Stalinist era uh, was one of real terror. About 10,000 people had been killed during this particular time, uh, between 48 and uh, about 68. Uh, many people have been just routinely uh, arrested, kicked out from positions, uh, many escaped, of course, I guided to the total censorship. Uh, some of the archives of the Communist Party are now being discovered, or opened up, and uh, studied, and so on, and they indeed uh, report some of the most incredible story out here. Uh, the, the Communists had their own list of prohibited works that uh, that uh, w was in 17 cabinets, you know, stocked up, you know. That was worse than the Habsburgs had, and before that the Jesuits had. There was an index uh, lectionum prohibitorum that, that uh, was, you know, very well known. And those of you who travel to uh, Prague, for example, and go to the Strahov uh, Museum there too, uh, all the prohibited books are listed there, and there is also a, an exhibit of the uh, literature from the so-called Samistat, the underground uh, operation. But uh, the reason for the uh, censorship was more than 
to prevent people from having ideas. And you know, that in itself would have been bad enough because you feel a sense of isolation. You don't know what's going on. You have all kinds of uh, ideas, you know, about the paranoia uh, is, is building up too. And of course they reinforced that paranoia by playing up the fact that the Soviet Union was the only one that would have come to our help in 1938 uh, against the Germans, which was not the case. You know, they also, uh, you know, essentially uh, generated hostility toward the Western powers for Munich and played up that Munich card, you know, the entire time and so forth, you know, that, that in itself would be worth another lecture just to focus on some of the methods to be used. But the most difficult part of that, and I think that something is that the people themselves have not recognized in the Czech Republic, particularly in the Czech Republic, is the fact that the, uh, the, the censorship uh, and so on was, uh, was particularly devoted to, uh, uh, to uh, substitute new memories to people. And the, the kinds of methods used, for example, is that they used the slogan Vierni Zustaneme, which was part of a speech that Benesh made during the funeral for Tomasz Masaryk. And, and that was meant to uh, uh, we, we will, uh, be uh, uh, faithful to the, uh, to the message that Tomasz Masaryk was giving. But of course, to them, Vierni Zustaneme meant that we would be faithful to the Soviet example and so on. The uh, date of 28th of October was being celebrated not as the Independence Day of Czechoslovakia, which it had always been celebrated with a big pomp, but in fact it was a, a date of, uh, to celebrate the nationalization that came up in 1945 out here. So let me try to sum up some of the things out here by uh, essentially suggesting uh, what are some of the lessons out here. I identified seven of these out here. First is the importance of the mindsets, you know, like the, the mindset I mentioned in connection with Lidice. Germans are no longer able uh, to be lived with and so on. The role of culture. And, and that is one of the things that you encounter uh, even today. Each time I give a lecture someplace in Prague or in the Czech Republic, people say, well, that's a very nice uh, thing that you are saying, but you see, we Czechs are different and unique, and, and, and that doesn't apply to us. And if you ask them you know, how unique they are, they usually don't know, but at least that's a mindset again over here. The national character. Much has been written about that too. And one of the uh, things, and much of that is not very complimentary to the Czech national character. NVS, uh, uh, mistrustful, and things like that. Uh, the complex of the small nation uh, is uh, something very much a part of the lessons out here. And I, I think that to some extent, uh, it, it's a message also to us because we are such a large power that we only focus and our scholarship is almost entirely directed toward the large uh, nations, uh, China, India, Russia and so on. And yet most of the countries are small countries like Czech and Slovak republics out here. But we find it very diffi difficult indeed to penetrate uh, the mindsets of Americans toward the large powers out here. And then I want to spend just a little bit of time about the relations between the Czechs and the Slovaks and the Czechs and Germans, and again about the leadership uh, failure out here too. Uh, so what are the mindsets? The mindsets are in fact uh, uh, very powerful cognitive maps that are built in our brains uh, that uh, develop over a period of time as we socialize, as we gain new information and so on. You know, I already mentioned the Czechs are unique, uh, but I think among the leadership group, particularly at the crucial times of 1945 and 1938, you know, Benesh and Masaryk have both assumed somehow that history is moving to the left, and that was based on a 
kind of generalized idea that uh, the capitalist uh, society is not sufficiently socially conscious and uh, that, that in fact uh, it has to be changed and amended. Uh, the small country uh, concept, for example, uh, forced the, the Czechs particularly to develop a new rationalization of being the bridge between the East and West. And they persisted with this attitude even after it became absolutely clear, you know, that there was no, there was nobody who was interested in the bridge, uh, particularly not the Soviets out here. Uh, that, uh, you know, they also believed Stalin, for example, that Russia was moving toward democracy, that it was going to be too busy rebuilding itself, and that it would uh, would have to give up on the uh, efforts uh, declared through the uh, the uh, common common turn. And was the common turn was started already in 1925, I guess, uh, and that they would in fact uh, give up some of the plans of world domination, and that certainly was not the case. Stalin was just outright lied, and this was a huge uh, factor for Benesch and his subsequent death and when he realized that he had been lied to because Stalin continually uh, promised the Czechs that they can develop their own way toward uh, uh, so, sort of uh, functional, uh, human, uh, socially conscious democracy and so on. Uh, they also thought somehow that the Czech communists are not quite as uh, radical as the Soviet communists were. And that, you know, after all, Gottwald was a nice guy and that uh, we can uh, get along with him too. Let me cite to you a speech that Gottwald had given to the parliament uh, earlier about the late 20s out here. You say finally that we are under the command of Moscow and then we go there to get our savvy. Well, it's like this. You are under the command of the Zivnostenska uh, Banka, that's uh, one of the major banks out here, and uh, we are the party of the Czechoslovak proletariat. And our highest the revolutionary headquarters really uh, is in Moscow. And we go to Moscow to learn, and you know what? We go to Moscow to learn from the Russian Bolsheviks how to wring your necks. Uh, and you know, the Russian Bolsheviks are masters in doing just that. The working people we recognize, uh, will recognize that it is necessary and possible to completely settle accounts uh, with your regime by armed uprising, social revolution, dictatorships of the proletariat. We will pursue this struggle regardless of sacrifice, doggedly, single-mindedly, until your lordships are swept away. So the, the tragedy of this is that the leaders, you know, like Hitler, Stalin, and so on, actually have told us what they were going to do. But of course, most people uh, didn't like to hear that and, and somehow disbelieved that. We also had the same kinds of mindsets toward the Slovaks out here, and I have a little more to say about that because we, in fact, uh, treated the Slovaks that they were not a separate country or separate culture, separate people. They were just younger brothers, some of them even uh, kept insisting they were younger cousins of the Czechs, and that they were part of the same uh, stock out here. So that was one of the problems out here. Now, role of culture. Uh, I think culture, again, is uh, not just values that we assume. You know, most American social science lists culture as one variable of many politics, religion, and so on are all the others. And people don't recognize that culture, in fact, is uh, the thing that influences all of them, including political organization values and, and ideologies out here. It also determines uh, who are the friends and who are the enemies. And you know, that what was rather obvious during the time immediately post-war, whom we can trust. The impact of communism and before that Nazism 
has been to destroy the trust among people. You know, you always wondered who was going to report on you. So, in fact, public opinion poll after public opinion poll uh, indicated that more than 70% of the people do not trust others, and in fact, others don't trust them as well. My brother came to visit me one time before he passed away, and he, we needed to call his, uh, uh, his wife in Mnyanik. So I dug out my uh, credit card and started dialing, and he was looking with white eyes open, and he says, how can you do that? And there was his wife on the phone. I said, well, I didn't realize that there was anything unusual, you know. We simply functioned that way. How did they know it was you? You see, the, the trust uh, uh, that was presumed on my part is that the, the people would accept my credit card, would in fact understand who is calling and that I will pay the bill. You know, that's a trust. And they don't recognize the democracy itself depends on trustful relationships. And if there is no trust, you know, most of the American political scientists were just organizing political parties. And that was presumably democracy. Democracy is a lot more than that too. Uh, Jewish people, and uh, of, of course this culture does relate to uh, minority relations, not just to the attitudes toward the Slovaks, for example. Even Masaryk, for example, believed that the Jewish people were really foreigners in Czechoslovakia. And of course the Romas, the Gypsies, are also regarded as being foreigners, therefore not having quite the same kinds of rights. Now this is changing, incidentally, now. When I first came to Czechoslovakia <coughs> shortly after 1989, there was something like 81% uh, percent of the people who wouldn't have even talked to a gypsy, to a Roma. And now it's something like 45 or something. The government is trying, but these are deeply ingrained uh, attitudes that are very difficult to change. And of course the West is still being distrusted. And I think that the fact that most people are stuck in the past uh, makes it also, you know, continually uh, reverberate the what could have happened uh, if and so on. And that's a uh, kind of useless argument. So the Czech national character, quite a bit has been written about that, including by Masaryk and of course before that by Comenius, and more recently of course by a philosopher by the name of Patochka, for example, I don't know if you know any of these names. And uh, they, uh, they comment, for example, on the impact of the regime uh, from the Austrian Empire already, and of course reinforced by the communist regime too, you know, because they played up uh, people against each other. Uh, they denigrated other people so that some people were first class, others second and third class citizens out here. And uh, that created a sense of uh, uh, sense of inferiority out here. The uh, isolation from information also created a kind of a paranoia out here. So, on the other hand, you know, it's amazing to know, for example, that the uh, tremendous growth and recovery that existed, let's say, between about 1870 and 1914 was almost un unbelievable, amazing. You know, there was a turning point when the Austrians started practicing a little better human relations with the uh, ethnic uh, groups and so on. Uh, but, uh, and, and the same thing happened, you know, after uh, 1945, too. there was a tremendous spurt of energy and creativity. The same thing happened after 1989, both in the Czech and the Slovak republics. And the, the fact you know, that you, when you go there, you will see a, you know, a tremendous progress being made after total devastation is amazing. This idea of the small nation, I think I already mentioned out here. But I think I would like to make one more point, and that is that this makes the lives of, of us who represent some of the so-called ethnic organizations like 
so-called like the Czech and Slovak cultural center and so on, very difficult to gain the attention of the general American public, uh, particularly the media and so on. So we do depend on all kinds of uh, creative uh, uh, ways to uh, try to get our story across out here and uh, to, uh, to try to suggest that this is a question of education that has an impact on everybody, not just on the so-called uh, ethnic uh, Americans out here. So I certainly urge you uh, to uh, pay attention to these organizations, to join them, to support them and so on, and, and to help, uh, particularly with the educational uh, programs, you know, that we should be supporting out here. Now, the Czech and Slovak relations are some things that I had also witnessed because the country was splitting just about the time that I was there as my third Fulbright grant, uh, 19, about 90 and, uh, to 1992 out here. Uh, th this was an amazing experience. Uh, my father was uh, what, you know, he always distinguished three kinds of people, uh, Czechs and Slovaks and Czechoslovaks. And he listed himself as a Czechoslovak, basically. So we had a, a tremendous, uh, it was a, a tremendous tragedy for us to have noticed that, that there was, in fact, a split coming up. And uh, I think that uh, one needs to reflect again on the relationships that developed over a period of time. When the Big Depression came in the 30s, the Slovakia was hit harder than the Czech Republic. And I still remember how from time to time young Slovaks were coming in, traveling from door to door, selling kitchen utensils and things like that just to survive because the unemployment was huge. Uh, I also remember from my father, for example, how paternalistically the Czechs have treated the Slovaks. For example, one of the uh, teachers uh, who was in the district of my father's raped a young uh, girl, underage girl. And he came to court and he was uh, condemned to go to Slovakia to teach as a punishment. And when my father found out, he just blew up and he went immediately to the Ministry of Justice and he tried to get that man to go back to the court and to be punished normally because he felt that this was not the kind of Czechs who should be going to help the Slovaks. Now the Czechs have done a tremendous amount of work because Slovakia was totally devastated uh, for particularly in the educational scene. Uh, you know, the, for, for the Czechs it was 300 years of the Habsburgs, for the Slovaks it was 1,000 years of the Magyars. And so that, you know, there was a conscious effort to in fact uh, uh, Magyarize the, uh, the Slovaks out here. So the Czechs provided tremendous amount of assistance, but it wasn't developmentally oriented because then they stayed in Slovakia and made it difficult for, Slo for the Slovaks to in fact assume responsibility for their own education and, and uh, training and so on. So, you know, of course, but the major point was that uh, the, uh, the Czechs uh, never understood that the Slovaks had any kind of a uh, self-defined uh, ethnic identity that was different from the Czechs, even though it was similar on here. And that was the, the tragedy. I was visiting somebody in the president's office uh, at the time, uh, it was uh, Pavel Tigrid. And uh, it was the day before Havel submitted his resignation when he saw that the country was splitting. And there was a large Slovak delegation of people I recognized. One of them, in fact, was a deputy prime minister who gave me a, a Comenius uh, Golden uh, Bull Award at, uh, at some point uh, before. And they wanted Banish to save the country. But, you know, part of the problem was that uh, uh, the people could not even agree on what questions to ask if there had been a plebiscite. 
for which you know people are being criticized that it didn't take place. Uh, here is the uh, the other kind of a problem here that developed in the negotiations. This is a presidential flag that flies over the uh, castle, and it's on. Uh, each time the president is in and it's taken down when he is not. The slogan here uh, says Pravda Vitezi. That was something that Jan Hus had stated at the stake when he was being burned to death, you know, way back in the 1400s. Pravda Vitezi. But uh, then the negotiations uh, for autonomy of the Slovaks would have required one change instead of Vitezi, this would have been Vitezi. And they simply could not agree to have. So the final solution was, again, typical of the Czech and the Slovak creativity, was to refer to Latin. <laughs> so that, that, there you were. Veritas vincit. <laughs> and, and that never, of course, materialized because the, the country already had split before. Now, uh, you know, many of the things that I'm saying are my own views, and I think you may uh, have different uh, perspectives on that, and I would welcome a discussion uh, shortly, uh, too. The, the Germans, uh, that was a different part of the problem. And in fact, it was the relations with the Germans that kept Masaryk from implementing the Pittsburgh uh, agreement to give Slovaks autonomy. Uh, uh, for fear that if we had given the autonomy to the Slovaks, that the Germans would be the next demanding it, and, and that he was not prepared uh, to do that for the Germans. Uh, the, originally, the Germans uh, came uh, to Bohemia. You know, there was no ethni ethnic uh, uh, awareness, you know, at the time of the uh, maybe year, year 1000 or something like that in fairly large numbers as uh, craftsmen of various kinds. They were very much welcome. But during the Hussite year, they were expelled, their property was confiscated. And uh, so when the things changed after the defeat of the Bohemian forces in Bila Hora, that was in, uh, what, 1620, wasn't it? Um, yeah. So then, uh, the opposite happened, you know. Then these Germans returned. They were different Germans. They they, they were much more aggressive, much more revengeful, and of course uh, that's the period from which the difficulties of relationship with the Germans started uh, uh, developing out here. Uh, up until 1970, there was uh, uh, practically no. Czech language that existed, you know, it was the re rebirth of nationalism came, and of course it had something to do with the French Revolution as well, and I think from that point on, the uh, ethnic uh, rivalry, of course, uh, intensified uh, either uh, more than that. Uh, when uh, it comes down to the ways in which the First Republic treated the Germans, uh, there was, on the policy level, every intention to be fair, to give the Germans uh, recognition and so on. But I think uh, when you examine uh, more specifically how that was being implemented, uh, I think it still was the idea of the Czechism, you know, that the Germans and the Slovaks have opposed uh, so much. This was our land and we are going to do in this land what we want. So that was one of the uh, difficulties that, of course, many even of the, the reasonable Germans, for example, had felt that they were not entirely welcome, that they were being uh, considered as intruders out here. As I mentioned, of course, uh, Lidice was the turning point uh, at which most people simply recognized that um, there is no way to deal with the Germans. and. The subsequent uh, explosion of the Germans came up. When the communists finally took over, the democratic leaders uh, failed uh, almost entirely. The only thing that they could say was, but this is illegal. So you see how formalistic they were 
in understanding democracy, how locked in a certain procedure. Benesh was the same way. And that is in essentially the leadership was both unable uh, to deal with crises, but also unable especially to deal with a totalitarian ideology like communism out here. And I think that this uh, crisis of leadership continued to exist beyond the communist era because the communists were the only ones who were educated throughout the years up until 1989. And you know, I have been returning to the Czech Republic and, and the Czechoslovakia uh, before that uh, quite regularly, maybe four or five times a year, uh, had been a member of different organizations and eventually became the Czech Honorary Council here too. So I followed the situation and it's only now, after 20 years of this, that you are beginning to develop uh, some sort of a leadership structure out here that I think is functioning reasonably well. Slovaks have done a lot better job and, and partially that was because Slovakia declared itself as independent in 1939 and did have some measure of uh, of uh, development here that was strictly devoted uh, to their own p particular needs out here. So in some respects, for example, the Slovak democracy uh, is uh, ahead of us. We will have some outstanding Slovaks on this program, and I urge you to come and visit with them. It will be done by Skype, and the persons uh, are uh, Butoras Martin and Zora Butorovi. Uh, he is uh, a former ambassador of Slovakia to the U.S. Uh, and also a, uh, a, a former candidate for the president of Slovakia. And I think both of them are devoted to uh, human rights and Martin particularly uh, felt uh, uh, victimized because uh, some of the anti-Jewish elements in Slovakia have labeled him as being Jewish simply because he wrote once an article uh, advocating uh, a human rights approach to the uh, Jewish people in Slovakia. And so he lost, but even then, you know, he received something like 20% of the vote out here. He's now heading a foundation that's devoted to human rights. So is his wife, uh, Zora, who is a sociologist. So I could not uh, help but giving you this commercial out here too. And uh, so thank you very much and let me thank you the way that one of my foreign students uh, uh, d did too. He received a homestay shortly after he arrived to the U.S. and his English was not very good but he noticed that the husband of the family where he was staying for the weekend called his wife honey all the time. So when he was ready to leave, he bowed very deeply. He was from Japan, just like a Japanese would. And he said, thank you very much, Mrs. Honey, for your hostility. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, and we'll have some time for questions.